thanks for coming. It's really good to see some new faces um, for this first Startup Grind of the year. Um, and it's a delight to have Mike along this evening, and of Pepper Smith. So with a, for those that are new, uh, it'll be a normal format. Mike and I will talk about his journey from Innocent through to Pepper Smith through to, to where he is now, and then give you guys a chance to ask questions at appropriate times. So if you've got a question, just pe please feel free to, to raise your hand. Um, and we'll try and fit you in as, as best we can. And we'll definitely have time and space for questions at the end. Okay? And then I believe we're carrying on at the end with more pancakes. So if you want to stay around at the end for extra pancakes, that's excellent. So, Mike, thank you for coming. Pleasure. Excellent. So let's start with um, your background before Innocent. What, what did you do? What did you study? What were you working mm. at? So, yeah, so before Innocent, Innocent was probably my first, it wasn't for my first real, real job after university, but it wasn't far out of that. So at university, to give you an idea of my character, I started off doing engineering. So okay. quite like numbers. So doing engineering. So I was doing uh, mechanical engineering at Aston University. And I remember distinctly at that time working very, very hard and noticing all of my buddies who I played football with and went to the pub with weren't working quite as hard. And they're just in, there's a real, I don't know how many people here studied engineering or the sciences, like physics. You just have a lot of contact time compared to people doing humanities and they even have a business, have a business degrees. So I noticed that I was working nearly a 40 hour week, full time job, and everyone else at university was doing the university life, working hard, but also playing hard. Yeah. Um, and the second thing that I also found out quite quickly is that you have to, to be an engineer, or a scientist, you have to work really, really hard. But when you get out the other side, the rewards actually, in terms of financial rewards, are quite small compared to other industries. So um, the realization was this year, to get this degree, I'm gonna have to work really, really hard, sacrifice a lot of things. And when I get out the other side, yeah, I might, have a, might be able to get a job, but it's not gonna pay me very much. But that's not right. So I switched over to a business degree um, because I thought they'd be more fun, more interesting, wouldn't have to work as hard, and there'd be better rewards at the end of it. Okay. So I started doing um, a business degree, which I, um, I really enjoyed. And then after university, I went into a, um, a software startup with an American company just set up a London office, and that was doing um, a warehouse management software. And it was from that experience, and, you know, doing business and doing operations, I got invited to join Innocent because they needed some help with their supply chain. Okay, but come on, how did you get the Innocent job? Uh, so, um, the guy who used to write all the Innocent labels, you know, the stuff that Innocent are famous for, mm -hmm. uh, was the guy I went to school with. Um, and exactly, so when, um, back in those days, this was 2000, right at the start of 2001, working for a startup was still a bit weird. So how many, how many people did Innocent have when you, when you started? Six. Six. So, and that's the three founders. So Innocent was unusual at the time. It had three founders, and that was actually really important to the success of the business. One was looking after operations and finance, one was looking after marketing, and that one was looking after sales. Mm. And it was the operations and finance guy who needed some help. And so that was me, and it was uh, so one of the, um, so Dan who, Dan Germain, who is quite famous in sort of mark copy marketing circles, mm. he was, um, he started off driving a van um, and then ended up running the labels, but he went to Cambridge with the guys who started, he founded Innocent. So it was him who said, I work for this great startup. Um, we need a bit of help. Do you fancy it? Absolutely. And the only reason I joined Innocent is because I always wanted, um, I was already planning to do an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial venture of my own. Mm. And I thought it'd just be a fantastic place to work for a couple of years, see how it's all done. Yeah. And then I would go off and do my own thing. So just to give a bit of context before we get into the details of the journey, when you, I want to sort of jump to the end, just to give it. <laughs> so when you left Innocent, how big were they then? They were certainly over 100 million, I think. And how many people? Um, when I left, it must have been about 150. Okay. And there are about 400 people now. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so what did you do on your, when you walked into Innocent, what did you, what was your first day? What did you, or your first week? What were the first jobs you were, you were doing? <laughs> Well, the, um, you were wool knitting those woolly hats, were you, I think? No, that's okay. way before that. 
Um, so, I mean, the first thing I remember about Innocent and why I really liked it, uh, two things I remember. When I went for my interview, I was interviewed in this weird industrial estate. It's that uh, Innocent back then is very much like Jimmy's Ice Coffee now. If you ever get to go to the Jimmy's office, yeah, that's pretty much how it, how it was with Innocent. Um, but it was really, really startup, so everything was really basic. And the table I was interviewed on in the meeting room was just a, a crappy old piece of garden furniture. So as uncorporate as you could be. Yeah. Um, but then I also, you know, was shown some of the stuff they had and I, yeah, I was just blown away things like they had an electronic fax. Okay. You know, this is yeah. quite basic stuff. It's like, but wow, you know, they were just doing some really clever stuff. Um, so that, yeah, the, it would be a good place to work. So when I joined there, I was there um, to do a um, couple of things, which was to take order from, orders from about the eight customers that we had and to work with the one factory. Hmm. So to work out what we're going to make. So it was take, it used to take the orders in the morning and then work out what we need to make in the afternoon. And innocent, right back in those days, the shelf life on the product was like 12 days. Right. So it was like rapid turnover in terms of product. We couldn't have too much, um, but also it was a growing, a growing business. So you had to make sure you made a little bit more each day. And how, how soon was it before you thought this might really go somewhere? There's a difference between believing it and seeing it, isn't it? When, how long did that take into the, into the journey? Well, when, when, when it started, when, when we started, I mean, first and foremost, it was just loads of fun. So I didn't really care. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, I did care, but you know, in terms of you know, it was such a vibrant place to work where you're going to learn a lot. It didn't it didn't really matter that much if it was going to be a huge success or not. And you know, we were all naive in those days. We just didn't know. I mean, the only people who seemed to have a, a very clear idea of what they wanted to do were the founders. And Innocent is still the only business I've ever seen where pre-launch they had the five-year business plan with all the numbers in and you always start you know if you how many here have ever built a business plan of a startup it's always like we're going to do three hundred thousand pounds in year one and then a million in year two and year three it's going to be three and then year four five it's going to be ten sixteen whatever and where you what just about all businesses do they start off with these grand ideas and then it gets really hard and actually year two is two hundred thousand and year three is three hundred thousand and i Good, this is not quite working out yeah. but Innocent just did follow the plan yeah. pretty much perfectly um, sorry I forgot the, the exact, exact question no, when there. did you start to think or when did you start to see it might turn into it something was, it always had huge. such good momentum really from the very start I mean it started small so that momentum still meant that you were quite small mm. but it just it did just grow exponentially and is that because the, it was order volume increasing or were they adding more Customers. It was mainly about order volume. I mean, right. yeah, there was oh, more customers, more right. distribution. In an FMCG business, it's all about yeah, distribution points times by how many products mm. you're selling in those distribution points. And the rate of sale was always good because it was quite a good product. And they were just adding more and more um, places to sell you know, every single week. So I used to do the um, the chart on a Monday morning meeting. It's like, here's how we've done last week in sales, because I was the ops guy, so I knew exactly uh, how many cases uh, we'd sold each week. And every week was like, new biggest week, new, new biggest week, new biggest week, new biggest week. Mm. Um, so we uh, definitely knew we was onto something. And did it, did it start to creak with the certain things where all of a sudden it was like, uh, we, we need to, I don't know, get the, more um, plant, get more machinery, get more... No, I mean... It was, um, in terms of operationally, it never really creaked. I mean, the, that business, it did have some problems um, around 2007, 2008, because um, a lot of businesses did at that time. Mm. But what they had, had done, they'd put um, lots of money and resources into the international growth, and it was quite hard to scale. In the UK, you've got 60 million people. If you go and launch the brand up in, um, yeah, up in Finland, you've got 5 million people. So, yeah. yeah, it's very hard to just make the numbers work. So how did your job change over the first first couple of years? So I was brought in to look after supply chain, which I did for the first six years. And it went from me um, with one factory, one spreadsheet and eight customers to um, running the, that part of the business. We had four or five different factories, lots of different countries. The team went up to about 40 people. Some of the spreadsheets were still the same. <laughs> yeah, the same. But um, yeah, it just, it, just, it just grew and grew in scale and complexity. And, and there must have been challenges going from from yourself to a team of 40 people. I mean, it just doesn't happen that easily or it's not... No, I guess it's hard, but you know, 
everyone within that business, we were all just learning on the job. Mm. I wouldn't say it would be unfair to say we were making up as we went along, but no one had experience of big corporates. You know, or, you know certainly they hadn't done it before. Yeah. So we were all just figuring out as, as we went. And so it all seemed very organic. And the only reason I, um, well, the reason I had stopped doing supply chain is because we grew to a certain size, and this happens with businesses. When you get to a certain size, you need to specialize and you need specialists. Mm. Whereas at the start, when you're um, when you start up, you just need a room full of generalists. Mm. Yeah, I'm, gen- right. I'm a generalist. So when it started getting bigger and you need, you need specialization, yeah, I wasn't prepared. I'm not very good at being a specialist, yeah. and nor did it particularly appeal. So the way I said I sidestepped that is I um, moved up to Scandinavia, took on the, the role of a country manager, and launched the brand up there. Because I know, even at that time, I was still thinking, right, I'm going to start my own thing soon, you know, sooner rather than later. So let's just make sure I'm getting all the experience I can. And from this uh, this amazing product and amazing brand. So that was always the intention. The always intention was to learn and listen and then go and do. Yeah, go and uh, do absolutely. And that was the intention from from day one. Day one. And the the great thing about Innocent as well is for, yeah, in the early days, it attracted a lot of very entrepreneurial minded people, mm. and a lot of those people have now gone on to do their own thing as well. Um, and again, I think because and that reason for that is because it wasn't a normal job. And it was back back in those days. He, you know, people were doing tech stuff, but working for a startup company, especially in food and drink, was quite unusual. Mm. Very different landscape now. But Innocent were one of the pioneers. Oh, why, why, why is it different now? What's the? Where, where do you think some of the difference? Are? I know we're jumping out of story, but it just feels like a yeah. good time to. I, th- I think bring up the difference. I mean, businesses like Innocent showed that there is. Um, there is appetite from consumers and retailers for challenger brands. Um, where it's all, where it's in fact harder now is that because you know lots of people want to start their own food and drink company. Mm. You know, think it's great. It's like I like food, and you know I've got they've got this idea, um, and they, they they want to get into it. But it's such a busy busy space. Lots and lots of entrepreneurs who are trying to come up with the brands. Huge companies who are trying to defend market share, and then the retail. Um, retail, the retail landscape has changed as well, where retailers are struggling. Mm. Um, so it means they're, it's harder, harder for them to um, actually innovate and get more brands in. So you, ha- you do have more brands now, but actually brands that are successful are, you know, are probably no bigger than before or even yeah. less. But it is easier. People, I think, they just they've just seen it, seen it, seen it done, so they think they can do it. And there's a lot of support around there. The uh, if you're into food and drink, there's um, uh, a couple of events and festivals, and there's the there's the bread and jam festival, which is held every year in London. And its whole purpose is to help in, in um, people who want to set up their own food and drink company, help them on that on that first journey. Because yeah, lots of people want to do it, but it's the, it's the know how, it's the tricky bit. And so, when did when did the idea for Peppersmith appear? So, Pepper- how, how, how much long? How much was it? How much time was it before you left Innocent? So, I first had the chat about. Uh, well, actually, wind back from that because Innocent was a um, a very a, an entrepreneurial company full of very entrepreneurial people. We were always talking about other products and other ideas, which is fun. Mm. So, um, and also what I was doing at that time was trying to identify from all these people like who might be, you know, who might be interesting to do uh, a okay. new venture with. So, um, so it was like a little incubator. It was, it was like a little incubator. Yeah. And, the, you know, they, and they were, the, the culture was very supportive of that as well. Mm. Um, because, you know, they knew they would get a lot out of people if they were, you know, if they were up for solving problems, trying new things. And building brands, yeah. And uh, so, um, so I, th- I was talking to a few people in that business about new things, and I guess you know what Innocent was doing really well um, was showing that there was room in the market for brands that were prepared to do things differently. And at the time, what was different was being natural, being sustainable, being good for you. Get on to oh, so maybe it's good for you later. That's, that's a different debate now, but a good for you and a brand to actually communicate that story. Mm. That was quite unique 
back then. Mm. It feels very normal now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and what we saw in that, you know, in those first few years at Innocent was lots of the other food and drink categories were doing the same things. Yeah, whether it's crisps or eggs or yogurt, you know, it was, you know, challenger brands taking the space of, you know, the, the big old fashioned brands with natural, healthy, sustainable mm. products with, with better brands. Yeah. And so um, the reason we went into um, chewing gum confectionery, because confectionery was one of the last categories to really be touched by these trends. Okay. It was very old fashioned, huge companies, I mean, you, you can name them, doing the same things they've been doing for not even the last five, 10 years, I want to say for the last 100 years, you know, making sugary stuff really cheaply. Mm. And so there is just an opportunity to disrupt that market. And that was the hypothesis going into it. And our big break was um, finding a manufacturer of chewing gum who was prepared to work for us. The problem you always have with, um, I guess, with innovation, you either have to do it yourself, and it's quite expensive and difficult to do, or you can get it you know, made for you. The problem with getting products made for you is that generally, those factories are very happy to sell you what they already do. So if you want to try and convince them to do something slightly different or radically different, it's like they've got to put a lot of effort and risk into that. And especially for a startup, why should they? Mm. So we spent a lot of time trying to find a chewing gum factory and there's not that many chewing gum factories around. There's one in the UK and that's Wrigley's. Yeah. And they weren't going to help us. So we had to spend time at trade shows and um, talking to people. And I came across a factory up in Finland um, who was quite quite small and being Scand- Scandinavian or Nordic. They got the natural, healthy, sustainable angle. And they said they were happy to work with us. And that was the, that was the big problem. And it was only then, I mean, we, we were building the business case for natural confectionery at the time, but it's only when we found a manufacturer who was prepared to work for us, that's when, you know, I quit my job at Innocent. So you, you'd done a lot of the groundwork while you were, while you were still at Innocent then? Yeah, and yeah. I think, you know, you, you always should do that. If you, uh, yeah, if you leave, you leave your job and you've got no income. But, but, and you, they, yeah. but were you doing it as like an acknowledged side hustle? Everybody no. knew you were doing it? No. Or was you, it was still on the side? No, it was, it, was it was still on the side. So, yeah, yeah it was evenings and weekends. Yeah. Yeah, and still, yeah, doing all the bits of the day job. But I think that, that's very normal. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it was more the fact I was thinking if they knew what you were doing and you were just actively talking about it, that would have been quite unusual. But Yeah, no, it, it wasn't like that. I was yeah. still very much focused and on, did, on the And did you get job. funding for Peppersmith or did you just do it yourself? No, or? so the way we did it, there was two of us. There's me and me and a chap called Dan. And we, we built the business plan. We found the manufacturer. And, it's only, and then we tested the prototype, and it was only then we quit our jobs. And then it's only then, apart from the money we had to put into the prototype, it was then we actually, you know, we were going to put some serious time and money into the business. Mm. So the way we did it is that we put our own money in to start, um, and that paid for getting the business up off the ground and also the branding. And, and the first mm. batch, and it was only when we actually got products into store, and the way we got products into store was by making the stuff, putting it in backpacks, and walking around the nicest delis and coffee shops in London, mm. and actually selling it ourselves. And it was only then when we started to see, you know, this product's going to sell, we went out and got seed investment. Mm, okay, and, and um, so again, because that, that story's quite similar to Jimmy in terms of what he did with his coffee, was put it in backpacks and go around yeah. and, and sell it. And is that a fairly, is that the way you do it? That generally, that was the way you did it. Okay. Until D 2 C came along. Okay. Yeah. And we'll, we'll move we'll, on. We'll to, get on to that. We'll but, but, but in terms, of, yeah, it's the best. You you have to validate your product. You know, are people going to buy this product? Mm. And the bigger retailers, or even you know the um, retail, you know, and the medium sized retailers, even if they've only got two, three stores, there's a there's a um, a chain of health food stores in London, well, there's Planet Organic and then there's As Nature Intended. Um, they've only got a few stores, but even then, they won't take you until they know that people are going to buy it. So it's only those independent coffee shops, delis and health food shops um, buying the product from you and then you actually having evidence that you know people will Someone buy this buy stuff. Um, then you can take it to the other store. So our, our journey was start with these cafes and delis that you sell to yourself and then moved to some of the smaller health food stores, then Whole Foods Market took it, then Waitrose took it, and then Holland Barrett took it, mm. and then you build on, on from there. 
And again, so that was uh, just a, a period of sustained momentum, was it, in terms of one would sell it and then they'd buy a box or two boxes or whatever yeah. it was and then they'd ring up more quickly and order another one, then you get to another yeah, store. I mean, you, what, what happens is, you know, you, you hopefully your, um, the amount of products people buy from the same store each which will go up as more people hear about it. But generally it's about, you know, people will buy this product, if you, especially if you put it on the counter. So it's about finding more counters to put the product on. Mm. And were you the first, what made you, obviously there's, there's those three pillars of, that we talked about with Innocent in terms of the, the healthy, and et cetera. But w were you the first gum that did that? Were you the first sugar-free gum? Apart from we, were, we weren't the first sugar-free gum, no. <laughs> Sorry. So the, 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 the big thing we wanted to do with, with, with our gum was to take out all the chemical crap. Which, Which, yeah. Ev everything. Yeah, I mean, I mean, chewing gum. The, yeah, the reason we love chewing gum is because it was the absolute the antithesis of the world that we yeah, knew yeah. in terms of like natural and healthy and sustainable. And then you had chewing gum that looked like a chemistry set. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, we were the first to at the time when we first started, we had a hundred percent natural gum base, which actually causes a lot of problems. Right. But that's okay. where we started. And sugar free. We um, we didn't want to use sugar, nor did we want to use things like aspartame. Okay. Because you yeah, know, there's um. Yes. We, we, I mean, we, we were never the sort of company that said, yeah, is going to give you cancer, and, you know, but there was a lot of people who clearly had a negative perception of it, and there were some people who were absolutely allergic to it. And so, how that. so we had to find a, an ingredient that wasn't sugar that was good for you, and that's where we came across Xylitol. So who's the who was the chemist? Was the chemist the factory, and you got them to do it, or did you both? So okay. it, I guess you know we were we was working with the factory and. Xylitol is a huge ingredient, it's a staple up in Scandinavia. Okay. So it was the, actually the factory we were introducing, we were told them with no spice and no sugar. So, well, it's got to be this thing called Xylitol, which no one recently hadn't heard of it. Okay. And if, for those of you who don't know, Xylitol is a natural, um, it's a natural sugar replacement. It's, uh, it's low calorie, low GI, uh, and best of all, it doesn't rot your teeth. It do actually okay. does the opposite, so it actually kills the bacteria that rots your teeth. So, okay. is it? It's the complete opposite of sugar, and it tastes like sugar. Okay. And did, did you need to, when you were going around the shops trying to sell it in, did, did you actually need to explain that much, or was it just the fact it was a natural, natural gum sell itself? Uh, to a certain extent. I mean, when you've got a product in, on shelf, it has to do a good job of selling itself. Mm. And so you have, we have to have the right, you know, the right case it's sat in and make sure the brand looks, uh, look nice. But yeah, you know, there's always, there's always people who are going to want to know actually, well, why should I be buying this stuff and not my pack of Wrigley's or, or, or whatever. And did, and did you manage to follow your business plan? No. In the way Innocent did? No. What went, what was different? Um, did it not go as quick as you want or quicker, Yeah, it definitely or? didn't go as quick as we want. We found it harder to get into all the supermarkets. I mean, you can find Pepperseth now, Sainsbury's and Waitrose and Morrison's, um, but it's still in a relatively low level of distribution and it's not in Tesco, which was in, in the plan, mm. not in Asda, which was, which was in the plan. Um, so, and does, yeah. the, does that come back to the points you were making earlier about it, just it's now a bit harder? It is now, but yeah. It, even, I, for, even if you're a real challenger brand in an industry that's not necessarily been, or in a food area that's not been challenged as much. Yes, so you're yeah. all of those things. I mean, it's, it's harder generally, but also, you know, we did a good job with Peppersmith in terms of we created this new, uh, new part of the category, but it's still, in terms of it, there wasn't as many people buying chewing gum mm. as there were things like coconut water yeah. at the time. So, yeah. you know, we were, um, there, there was a reason that we were really the only brand in this space because well you know, it was a good business for us and we built a nice brand a nice business out of it it still didn't have the demand that we were hoping for okay and and so when so when did you sell 2018 2018 so quite a long yeah long and, and there's one of the reasons uh, we ended up selling the business uh it w was because we were sort of we needed the next round of funding would have been you know equivalent to series b yeah um and it was 20 16, 17, um, when Brexit happened yeah. and the, you know, the exchange rate got absolutely crushed, we were buying our stuff from Finland and other, elsewhere around Europe. So you know, we'd lost a bit of momentum, we needed more growth, but then all of a sudden you know, the margins sucked out the business as well. Yeah. So it was very, very hard for us to raise more capital. We had offers there, but in terms of the valuation for the business, we, would have, you know, we were almost going to have to give away too much of the business to get the money that we wanted. Mm. So the conversation turned from fundraising to actually 
you know, we quite like this business, but we'll, you know, we want to buy it from you. And, and how did you go about selling the business? Did you use a broker? Were you approached? How did, how did that work? Yeah, so the way, the way it worked, we, we were having these conversations about fundraising, uh, and then we got into this conversation about selling the business, so that it, it, it led naturally from those conversations. But the, um, the, we'd agreed to sell the business to a particular entity, let's call them that, uh, and it all fell apart. And uh, so we were left with you know, a business that still needed some funding, um, and we didn't have it. And we convinced ourselves, actually, we're now ready to sell it. And so when it didn't work, we're like, well, what, what do we do now? We still need funding, or are we going to sell this thing? So I, um, I took the decision to uh, find a broker, and it was you know working with a broker yeah. we, we found the right deal for the business but my um the main motivation for me for selling the business was because after doing it for eight or nine years i was ready for a new challenge mm. and i think you know it's really important for you know, anyone in business to know what their real objectives are i just wanted to do something new not because i didn't like the brand or the opportunity or the team and all, all of that stuff it was just it, it was time for to do something new yeah. um, so for me it was just time to cash out because ha- had we got more money into the business I would have been in another four, five, six, seven year cycle yeah and so how big were Pepsmith when you when you sold in terms of people and so I mean we're still relatively small so yeah. five, six people so sort of, mm. you know two million revenue four million or five million sales in the shops yeah. Um, but yeah still a relatively small yeah. business huh? so before we talk about the, the D2C stuff any, does anybody have any questions on Innocent Peppersmith. If you if you haven't seen Peppersmith, hopefully you have. This is this is the this is the product. Let me see that. And this is the, um, we changed the brand in about a year ago, so you might recognise the the moustache. So we have mince and chewing gum. Any questions on that? Yeah, so what, what, yeah, so what happened there was they um, they had just invested too much on international growth. And that international growth was harder to come by than um, domestic growth. So they just had to change the model a bit. Yeah, so they needed, and they needed some money to support that international growth because they couldn't do it you know, organically. And then they started the conversations with, I guess, a lot of people, and one of them was Coke. No, and the amazing thing is it still hasn't really. You know, the... Um, the founders of Innocent put down such strong foundations. Um, it's, what, it's like, like yeah, Ben & Jerry's. Mm-hmm. That it still runs as a um, very autonomous business doing an innocent thing in terms of the way it makes its products, the way it markets its products, and the way it um, yeah, still gives so much money back to charity. I don't know if Innocent has a foundation where lots of the money, the profits made, are generated back into um, into the wider world. So uh, it's allowed to do that because while... Um, you know, Innocent is um, it's owned by Coke. It's one of the only Coke businesses that's still growing. You know, Coke, you know, sort of soft drinks industry, you know, sugary drinks don't sell as much as they used to. Mm. So Innocent is allowed to do its thing. Yeah, I mean, I, the nice thing about our chewing gum, I mean, the problem with chewing gum, right, is that people throw it on the floor. And it's disgusting and you know yeah. it's, it's an eyesore no one no one wants that because we were making a premium chewing gum with health benefits pretty much knew that you know our consumers are not the ones who are throwing it on the floor and the other thing that we used to do right when we very first started in the back of our packs i don't know if anyone remembers this he used to sort of um, pepper smith in the very very early days is that we used to put a little booklet of papers in, in the back of the product so there was oh, okay. a, there was some papers to dispose of the gum. The reason we took that out is because we worked out that most people just didn't use them. They added twenty or thirty p to the end consumer cost of the product, right. and you know the, everyone liked the idea. But the reality was no one was really using them. Mm. So so we took it out. Uh, yeah, yes, in terms of we we were working with. Yeah, I guess professional food factories who have um, testing facilities and laboratories and all that sort of stuff. Yes, we had to do that. And which is much harder, you know, if you try and do it. You, you, this is why, you know, you can't really make chewing gum in, in your kitchen or your garage. Uh, 
so we had, so we had a brand and we had a product and we were generating sales and that's um, with that I guess we validated our hypothesis is that people will buy this product what we couldn't prove at the time is how big it could be but you know we you know we had a um, we had a nice brand that people liked and we'd managed to generate a bit of PR um, so there, there was already a bit of interest and momentum behind the business so we went out and met various business angels and where our real seed funding came from well two two places family and friends and what you you know people say family and friends not direct family my family certainly doesn't have a lot of money to invest in startup food and drink businesses but it's always yeah friends of a friend you know um and then we were introduced to a bunch of um i guess angel investors who had experience in investing in other food and drink brands so you know we showed them what we're up to and we managed to get some money from them was that a regional angel Group we we did all that, but you know we ended up leaning on our own personal networks, and we yeah, were lucky that was working within um, the industry, and the the, you know, the innocent name obviously had quite a high value on it as well in terms of you know it enabled, opened some doors. But there, open doors is one thing, but it's you know showing that you know we've got the brand, we've got the products, and we've got uh, evidence that this this thing sells. So what what sort of levels of revenue do you need to show uh, for a food and drink to get some level of angel funding? It depends what valuation you're asking for. So the sales won't, won't affect that? Well, it only depends how far you're into your journey. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, you, it's just about giving people belief. And one thing I, I definitely learned is you know, when you're raising money, it's far better to do it very, very early on because it's so much easier to sell the dream than the reality. And in terms of, you know, when people actually start looking at the numbers, they start pulling it apart. It's actually, so, you know, because in the business plan, it says your rate of sale is going to be 15 a week. And actually, I went to my local store and it's three. Yeah. yeah. And it has a big impact. Huh? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How long is a piece of string? Yeah. But, you know, the, the most important thing with funding is not to give up, you know, not, not to ask for too much and not to give away too much because it really impacts the further rounds. And where, you know, we didn't quite get there, but where, where it could have gone is, uh, you know, we could have raised more money, but you know, the founding team gets so diluted, what's the point? You're just working for someone else then? So I know that in software, for Angel, you'll give away anything between generally six and, to good angels, anything between six and 20%. And then you'll, 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 VCs will generally take 25, but you look at that level for, obviously you want to be keep it low, low as you can. Well, that depends on where you are in your in your journey. Yeah, I'm uh, not, I'd say that's that sounds about right in most categories, most areas, tech or FMCG products. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if we couldn't find a factory, we just wouldn't have done it. And in terms of like licensing ideas, it's like so hard to sell an idea every you know show someone a brand everyone's got an opinion on a brand it's um yeah i don't think that was an option what we would have done is tried a different product sector a different area yeah i remember at the time we were we were looking at f falafels and all sorts of things. craft beer we were going to do craft beer can you imagine doing that that would have been rubbish wouldn't it, it never would have worked <laughs> we didn't do craft beer we did chewing gum so so let's move we'll come back so we'll have time for a lot more questions as well let's so you've sort of got a, an interest in, in D2C, direct consumer. Mm -hmm. So how do you think that's changed the, the FMCG industry in the last few years? Let's start there. Yeah, so I mean, we, we did about 30% of our revenue at Peppersmith. Um, D2C, which is a mix between selling stuff on our own website and Amazon. Okay. And that was the part of the business that I really loved for two reasons. One, we had all of a sudden we had direct relationships with your own customer. And when you don't have that, when you sell stuff in shops, you never ever know who buys your product unless you stand on a shelf and see someone pick it up and ask them. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, and, then, and then secondly, we weren't beholden to the retailers. I mean, the retailers, all the horror stories that you hear about the retailers, that, they're 100% true and are probably a bit worse. Um, and the reason is because they don't make any money anymore. They're, they're struggling, so they rely on extracting all they can out of suppliers mm. and they don't have the best people anymore, the best systems or the best processes because they haven't got the resources to, I guess, to grow and develop. So it's really hard working with retailers. And, you know, sometimes it depends on, you know, one buyer likes you, one buyer doesn't. And, um, yeah, 
and you will not get you'll get a listing or not get a listing for really spurious reasons and that's just so frustrating so direct to consumer you can um you can sidestep that so we loved it um and we we just do more and more and it was a bit weird because we were selling yeah the most impulse products out there mince and chewing gum um direct to consumer which is a it, it's a bit crazy because it obviously then it becomes not an impulse purchase and it actually doesn't make any sense for us to sell a single pack. Yeah, you're just there. selling boxes. So we're selling you know, four boxes. And the, the, the advantage that we really had is because our product was, it's relatively small and light. It means the postage wasn't that expensive. And you can see we, we send it out in these things, which fits in a, a large letter. You, if you've ever bought a, a grace yeah, box, yeah. you'll see it's, it's the same. And that's, you know, you can get potentially low postage fees. The, 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 you go two, two millimetres higher than that, you're paying an extra two pound on, um, on postage on fees. Postage. So it, it makes a big difference. So we had this little area of our business that we, that we really, really loved um, and just wanted to do more of it. But what we were finding was, you know, starting to talk to other brands, you know, every, all the brands were trying D2C and asking me, what are you doing? How, how are you getting this to work? And what I found then is like, everyone was in the same position as us. Just like, you know, we're just working out as we went along. Mm. You know, it was such a new thing mm. for, for, especially for food and drink to be doing, that there was no, there's no, there, there was no best practice out there. There was no playbook. Everyone was just figuring it out, and uh, you know, I always, I'm the sort of person who, who does want. I, I want, I want to buy buy the book. I want to learn from other people's successes and failures, and yeah, you know, they can show me how it's done. And I said, you know, I four years ago, if no one writes the book about launching D 2 C brands and doing it properly, I'm going to write it myself. And so that's what you do. And that's it. Yeah, you know, it's it's always it always became a personal bet to myself that you know if no one else writes the thing, I would do it, and that's what I'm doing now. So I'm writing a book on um, the most you know successful direct to consumer brands, and the reason I'm writing it is because you know everyone is trying direct to consumer, but for lots of different reasons, it's actually quite hard to do. Hmm. It's mainly about you know sort of product market fit. But, you know, there's other stuff as well. And I want to help businesses like us who try, you know, try out to work out actually does their product fit a direct-to-consumer model? And if it does, what do they need to do to make it, make it successful? So, the, uh, so, uh, just what I got, so in terms of your uh, at Peppersmith, you were selling direct-to-consumer, but either from the website or through Amazon. Is there a danger that you're just potentially moving one risk, either supermarkets to another, as in, Amazon, who are potentially going to squeeze you for margin in a slightly different different way. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean Amazon. We were one of the first um, Amazon vendors, which means we sold directly into Amazon, and they resold our products on the right. consumer in the same way that a, a retailer does. So um, I think things have probably changed now, but it was, it was early early doors for us. But you know, it was always really good for us because because we were in yeah you know, people have heard of us, but we weren't everywhere. For example, we're not in Tesco's. We're not in we're in Sainsbury's locals, but we're not in main Sainsbury's stores. Anyone who wanted to buy our product, they couldn't just go to the nearest shop and buy it. Mm. So it, you know, it enabled um, people to get hold of our products if they wanted it. So that was always really good for us. I always thought, and this might, might, might still happen, is that the more Peppersmith grows and the more mass distribution it gets, that online channel actually might shrink because that's not the way people want to consume our products. They're just right. buying it directly from us because that's really the, the, uh, the most convenient way for them to get it. But presumably with D2C, you're getting to a whole different range of challenges and that you've now got to sort your own logistics, you've got to sort your distribution, so you've got to start thinking warehouses, where do you have them? Yep. Um, so there's certain characteristics of a FMCG business that you think are more suited for direct consumer than, than not? Yes, and... It comes down to um, you know, why would people buy your product direct to consumer? Uh, first and foremost, you know, is it a new product or a service that it solves some pain that you can't currently um, <coughs> that you can't get from elsewhere? Mm. Yeah, that that's a number. And that's you know that's the biggest thing. And then secondly, um, yeah, is it the right format to be delivered through the post? Um, and sort of what scale? I've just helped um, been helping a, a drinks brand 
you do um, sort of seltzers and posh cola and stuff, trying to set up their direct consumer business. And what they've learned actually, it only works if people buy 24 or 48 cans from them. Mm. And you know, most consumers, they're not in that space. It might be good for selling to shops, mm. but in terms of consumers, it's just like, you know, because you are just selling a product that's quite heavy and relatively cheap and it means all your money just gets wrapped up in picking and postage. Yeah, yeah. and so, so would you, in, in that case, what would you uh, sort of help them about? Would you advise that they don't do it? Would you advise that they do it through Amazon so they, they just, Amazon manage all the yeah. drop shipping, you don't have to and worry it, about it, it? Or how would, you, how would you go about that? It depends, it depends what your objectives are. But you know, I'd say you probably still do it because there are gonna be some super fans out there and probably some shops who still wanna buy it from you that way. It's the, you know, just be a better way for you to, for you to do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Amazon, I mean, love or hate Amazon, they do make it very easy for you to buy all sorts of products. Mm. You know, I mean, they've just got such huge economies of scale on their logistics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, it just makes sense. So, yes, you, could, you should probably do that. But where, you know, where you might not want to do Amazon is if you are building a pure direct-to-consumer offer and you want people to go to your website and do subscriptions and all, or, you know, all, all of that stuff, then Amazon is probably just going to confuse things. So who would you put up there as, like, the really successful current D2C brands that haven't sold? So who who are actively doing really really well on D two C? So the one the brand that I like best at the moment is All Plants. You've heard of All Plants? They do um, vegan frozen vegan fruit food through the post. Okay. It's so really hard logistically frozen food. Mm, yeah. Um, but they they got their own, the way they're doing it. They've got their own facility, their own cooks, their own chefs, and you have to buy in bulk so you can sort of offset the high delivery costs. Um, because you're buying enough and they're just doing a great they've just done a round on cedars and um, I love that business I didn't invest because they just had such a crazy valuation on mm. it just thought it was you know for, yeah. for me as a you know an individual investor it was a poor investment but fantastic business yeah interesting well I mean the the the, the volume is driven by customer demand so it's how many people are buying your product from Amazon. So two ways you can sell through Amazon. There you can be an uh, Amazon vendor, which is actually quite hard to be a vendor now. And you can argue that you might not want to be because Amazon have so much control. And then there's Amazon Marketplace. And then mo you can get your product listed fairly easy on Amazon Marketplace. And then you've got the choice whether you know, Amazon is just your shop front or you actually use Amazon Fulfillment Services as well. A lot of brands, we stayed as a vendor, but a lot of pl uh, brands are doing marketplace and vendor. Yeah. Um, because with the, the problem with Amazon, it's such a behemoth now, um, and there's so many products on there. Uh, things just happen all the time. You get competitive products listed, and uh, information changes, price might change and to get Amazon the machine to make to make any changes is really hard whereas if you're a marketplace uh, uh, seller you're you're in control of much more of that stuff yeah so as Amazon but so I'm not so, so as Amazon vendor Amazon buy your product from you like like and a retailer they, would. And they sell on, so they're just yeah. another retailer basically. yeah and yeah, that means okay. they're in control of the pricing as well yeah, yeah. okay whereas if you're marketplace you you, 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 you pay them a commission for yeah, selling through yeah. the Amazon machine okay Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had, um, we, we did about half of our business with subscriptions. So, um, and this is where it works well. It, you make it really easy for people to buy the product. Or, you know, because they can, if you believe in the power of xylitol, you should be having five grams of xylitol a day. You know, so you should have a, a, a pack of mints every two or three days. So you need a constant supply. And that's where, you know, subscription works really well. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I think I think that's really key. You've got to give people full control. Otherwise, they feel you know it's like a gym membership. You're just being sucked in for you know. Um, and consumers are so used to subscription now; they're really savvy. If you don't offer them full control, make it really easy to cancel or put on hold, people just won't sign up, and nor should they. Yeah, I mean, we as you know, for the purpose of business, that was. It was quite important, but it was we're not the same as a subscription-led D2C business like Grace.com. 
you know, where that, you know, how many customers they're acquiring and what their, what their term, term, their churn rate was, is, you know, those metrics are so important because that informs them how much money they should, they should be spending on their marketing. Yeah, we did a bit. Yeah, and we did, you know, we did some digital stuff and we also did some, you know, old fashioned above the line, you know, which, you know, you've got some stuff in, 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 in magazines, in the press, a tiny bit of outdoor, but it's so expensive. And this is why D2C brands love doing things digitally. If you hit digital marketing, digital marketing is marketing. Hey, we're in Bournemouth. It's the centre of the world for digital marketing. But, but what the difference Apparently. is, it, when, when it morphs into the thing called performance marketing, is that you can actually measure <laughs> yeah, the effectiveness of your marketing. And for a, yeah, for a D2C brand where data is everything, it's so, so powerful, because it just teaches you know, where you can dial up and dial, dial down instantly. The problem is now is that all brands are trying to do it, and the bigger brands, so to actually do any advertising on the likes of Facebook, it's gone from really cheap to really flipping expensive. And that is a, is a real barrier. And it means as, as, it, as this whole market matures, as a D2C brand, you've got to have more going for you than it did normally. Gone are the days, all the low-hanging fruit has been picked. You can't, you can no longer buy razors from China, say, you know, we're the extra consumer brand, so it's going to be a bit cheaper, and, st- and, and have, you, ha- have a business built around that. Now you've got to have a product that, you know, is quite unique and a service that is unique for it to work. And then if you do that, you can justify, um, you can justify maybe getting a bit more money into the business to pay for higher acquisition costs. But importantly, if you've got a business like that, people will come to, come to you. So there'll be a lot of word, word of mouth advertising. You'll, you'll get PR and you'll find that you're, you're actually acquiring customers, not from paid advertising. It's the best way, you know, some brands out there, they, they can do a fantastic job of, you know, building a brand without doing lots and lots of traditional paid advertising. Mm-hmm. I mean, Tribe, the, um, the nutrition bars, who built this whole running community, they're a great example of it. They built a community of athletes they're the ones who buy the product and tell their friends. Mm. Now they've, they they do do a bit of um, digital marketing for sure, but yeah, their um, their marketing efforts are actually away from putting ads on Facebook. Mm. Whereas a company like Huel, you know, I don't know if you've seen Huel, they do powdered food, space food. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, they make it really easy to get your nutrition without buying, you know, yeah, food. Um, but they um, they did, they built their business in Facebook by um, doing lookalikes. Hmm. So they find people who are into their products and they get Facebook to mimic those customers and find more customers like them. And sure enough, th- those customers all, will also like the product. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but it is, it is getting harder and harder to do. And I'm, I'm really quite upset about that because it's not the fact that there's more um, startup brands who are driving demand. It's actually the bigger brands Buying the, buying the space. And they might be doing it because they think, oh, this is the way to do marketing now. But it also, it actually, it puts up more barriers to mm. the challenger brands. Yeah, it's definitely hard. So the best success for us well, was PR. So we had some um, uh, amazing articles written about the brand, but more importantly about the brand benefits that really transformed the business. We got a huge uplift in demand and that was sustained. Um, and we were always trying to replicate that, but you can't replicate that because in, in the world of PR, once someone's told the story, you know, you, the, you, the, the, the next newspaper is not gonna say that, to tell the same story. Mm. Um, so um, yeah, we wish we could have done more than that, but the reality is that we couldn't. So where do I wish we didn't spend the money? And some of the, some of the frustrations I have is actually with the retailers. So when you sell to retail, they, uh, they're a customer, they buy products from you and, they, and then they put it on the shelves and they can charge what they want and put it where they want. But all the retailers do this, you know, to a certain extent, do this thing where they sell you services, which is normally shelf space and marketing, and they charge you for that. And what I'm not going to mention any names here, but a lot of the retailers just don't follow through. Either they haven't got the systems and processes to enable um, you know, the new thing you pay for to happen, or actually they're just really negligent and they, they, and they, don't, they don't deliver on their promises. But because they're a customer, they, um, they behave like we're the customer and we're, and we're still right. Mm. 
Um, and we end up having some huge fights and frustrations with those retailers because if you spent a lot of money with them and they're not giving you a return on that. So I probably would have um, been for a, a bit more careful about which retailers we, um, we invested our, some of our marketing cash on. So if anybody wants to know who those retailers are, you can ask Mike afterwards. I'm sure he'd be more than happy to tell you. Yeah, you can, um, you can, probably, you can probably guess as well. <laughs> uh, and perhaps can compare brands with somebody from Jimmy's as well. Um, just as a final question, if somebody is considering starting a, a food business, mm -hmm. what one, two, three piece of advice would you, would you give them in terms of what to do, where to go? Would you suggest somebody go D to C? What, what, what sort of words of wisdom would you have for somebody? Yeah, I, I think D to C is a great way to get started because, you know, the, the, the good thing about D to C, there's really low barriers of entry. So you can set up a Shopify, website really quickly and easily and then you've got a platform you've got a marketplace to sell your products uh, and that's really good because you can if you, you can see you know do people want to buy this stuff and you've got that relationship with the consumer either via data or better still you've got their email addresses or maybe in the phone number you can have a conversation with them the best conversations i ever had was actually people mo phoning up and moaning saying where's my delivery solve that problem and then you can have a great conversation about with them it's like where did you hear about us why do you buy a product what can we do better what are you looking for all, all that stuff so um yeah d to c it's a great way to be, uh, to get started but beware it's so hard to scale a business d to c because you've got to pay lots and lots of money to get people to get an audience um and even then there's only so many people who are going to buy especially a food and drink products online so I think that should just, you know, for market intel. And then after that, you know, so have you got a product with the right level of demand and the right level of skills and um, infrastructure within your business to be able to sell to the retailers? And it is harder and harder to sell into retailers. So you've got to say, yeah, have you got the capability and the product to do that? But D2C is a good way to test that out. Cool. Um, Mike's going to stay around after. Um, I know he's very interested. In, if, you, if you're interested in a D2C book, what sort of thing would you like to see in it? So if you've got any ideas, then please feel free to pass those on to Mike. Again, ask him about the retailers that you shouldn't be working with. Um, and I believe we are allowed more pancakes. So um, thank you, Mike. Great, thank you very much.